I'm Mr. Potsable, Joshua Potts, always with the brother with the same mother, Aaron Potts, Super Hot Potts, and you're watching and listening to your favorite two black runners every single two black two. two. And for those listening on on this Tuesday, you heard that applause. We're, we're bro, live. That's crazy. We're live that's in crazy. New York City, bro. All right, so we're on our second session now for the Two Black Runners live po podcast at Hoka. It's really an honor. It was a great talk the first time. But next up, we have two Northern Arizona elite OGs, OG. originals, straight out the gate. The 10th fastest American marathoner of all time for the women, Kellen Taylor, UCSB legend, Stephanie Bruce, and Picky Bars Queen as well on the podcast joining us here today. First off, Kellen and Stephanie, just how are you doing? How are you enjoying New York City? You're racing this weekend on Sunday. Like, it's an exciting time, 50th anniversary too. Like, there's a lot going into this race. How are you guys feeling? Um, I mean, New York City is an amazing city. i uh, always happy to be here. Um, the marathon itself is unparalleled to any other marathon that I've competed in. So I'm always happy to be here and healthy and able to compete. Um, yeah, and I keep telling people I'm just trying to get to Sunday because there is a lot of excitement going around. Um, but sometimes for us, like we have to try to keep our excitement level down a little bit because um, you want to save it for that last 10K up Fifth Avenue and back into Central Park. And both of you had like great success at uh, NYC Marathon before in the past. I think, Kevin, did you get like eighth before here? Seventh. And seventh, eighth. seventh. And then you were 13th, 12th. I've been 10th and 11th. 10th and 11th. So pretty close. <laughs> But you all finished very well here. What is it about this marathon in particular that you think you do so well at? I mean, for me, it's the crowds. The crowds are absolutely amazing. I mean, you come off of those bridges, which don't have the crowds on them, and you just get flooded with cheers. And I don't know, it's really hard to stay composed when you're coming off of them. Um, I feel like you get that burst of adrenaline, which you don't necessarily want when you're like 13 miles in, but <laughs> you get it anyways because it's hard to kind of contain your excitement with um, the amazing crowds that are found all throughout the course. Honestly, I think we do well here because of how we train out in Flagstaff with um, Hoka NAZ Elite. We just put in a lot of high volume, really hard workouts. And I think Coach Ben knows the marathon, um, you know, better than most coaches in the country. And he just prepares us really well. So when we get to really tough parts on the course, um, you know, I think both Kellen and I are grinders and our teammate Alphine. And so, yeah, when it gets really tough, like that's where we really thrive. And I think that mentality has led to our success. And then personally, I was born at Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, so I'm a New Yorker. So I hey. have the pride of trying to do well here. <laughs> Is there any type of goal that you guys have for tomorrow, if that's time, place, or just something personally in your running? Any goal that you have, Kellen? Um, we'd like to be first and second. Let's go. <laughs> I'm down with that. Bring the brooms. Maybe tie. That would be fine. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, whenever I come to a big race, any race, um, you know, I just want to be sure that I'm putting, you know, my best foot forward, uh, giving everything that I have. And I know that's kind of cliche to say, but, um, you know, I want to go out there and do the best that I can on that day. Um, you know, sometimes there's things that you can't really control when you're out there racing and um, just being grateful for being there and doing the best that I can. And hopefully that puts me, you know, somewhere on the podium. Yeah, our uh, our team has this, I guess, like creed or motto um, of Ben calls it optimistic reality. And so I think what that, how that translates for us is, you know, as professional athletes, and you know, for the most part, most runners like there's a part of us that are big dreamers, but you have to train where your feet are, and so you can have this idea of like best case scenario, all the stars align, what that means. Um, but then you have to put in the work. And I think for Cal and I over the years, you know, we've put goals out there and both of us haven't met the goals that we really want. But yeah, we wouldn't be coming here if we weren't chasing the podium. So um, I think that's, that's both of our goals. But as she said, we just need to put our best foot forward, see how the race unfolds um, and, you know, try to be in at that last 10K. I love that mentality. Like, 
me and Joshua are myself, I'm a big like why not guy when it comes to like goals and stuff like that. Because I always ask myself when I'm trying to like do something, like I always say, you know, I want Running Report, I want Two Black Runners to be the best podcast ever. And it's like, some people be like, well, why do you think that? And it's like, why not? Like, why not? Why can't? I'm going to put in the work and it's going to happen. We just had Alephine up here, got me hyped up, hyped <laughs> up on that. But it's like, why not? So I love that you all have that mentality too. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you though, with all of these majors happening in the fall, like how did the un uncertainty of COVID, how did that affect your training and your build up to the marathon? If anything, if it did. When all, when... COVID first came about, you know, the world kind of shut down, um, rightfully so, and, but our training didn't. Um, we kind of trained through everything all last year, um, this whole year, like in preparation for any race that were happen would happen to pop up, because um, we didn't know that the Olympics were going to be canceled uh, the first couple weeks that it was going on. Um, and then we didn't know if the majors were going to happen in the fall. And even this year, you know, everything was so uncertain. So all that we could do was control what we could, could, could control. And that was, you know, putting in our work, doing our workouts, um, and just hoping that something were to pop, would pop up and we would be able to kind of seize the moment. Yeah, you know, similarly, I think um, as professional athletes, we were actually really fortunate because... We, w we were training all last year, and when we found out the track trials were postponed and the Olympics, we still trained as if they were going to happen. So then possibly when they happened the following year, we knew, okay, we trained really hard. We were ready come end of June, early July when the trials were going to be, you know, supposed to be. And then we got lucky, like Hoka helped us put on a track meet last year that we got to run. So we had all these like little like micro meets mm -hmm. um, being put on. So for us, I don't think we were affected that much. It, it is our job. So there was a lot that we, you know, we lost out in those opportunities financially. But then it's kind of like once the running community starts to put things together, it's just like a snowball effect. And yeah. I think once you saw one major being like, we can do this, and all the other majors were like, well, we can do this too. And I think that just shows like what the running community is like. It's like this snowball effect of everyone trying to work together and figure out how can we move forward safely and yeah, put these big races back on. And we mostly definitely saw that from like the sound running meets that you guys like attended and even like the trials of miles as well. And then as we come in here, we see all these marathon majors like this fall for you guys being marathon gals. How exciting has that been to see like Chicago, Boston, Austin, Berlin, like back everything, just watching all of that for these past couple of weeks. And now you get the trial. Like how is, has that been like nerve wracking, exciting, like just processing, seeing all these marathon majors happen. Now it's finally your time. I mean, it's incredibly exciting. You know, we've been waiting a whole year for it. Um, so it's super exciting to be able to be back here. Um, and then it, also just to be able to have all the majors kind of back to back is kind of what it seems like. Yeah. Um, so it's great to see the successes of, you know, other people in those races and kind of coming off of the, the crazy year that we had had, um, seeing how successful people are in the marathons. We were just joking because um, I ran the virtual New York City Marathon last year um, in Camp Verde, which is like just down the road from us in Flagstaff. And we kind of made it like a really hard workout where Kellen did some of it with me and then a couple of my other teammates and my husband, Ben Pace. Um, and I ran like 235 kind of in that workout practice. And just because it was a virtual, I was like declared the winner. We're like, why is no one asking me? I'm the defending champ defending uh, <laughs> in the virtual marathon. Um, I think that just shows like we had to be really lighthearted with it, realizing like things will come back and you're seeing that this fall. And then for us, like the last couple of weeks have been our hardest weeks of training, but it's been cool because it was broken up by watching Boston and Chicago. So then we, in the midst of being really tired we could be like oh yeah you're, like, you're tired for a reason all these people are racing well because they were all tired four weeks before that so it was a really good motivator for us to be like there's light at the end of the tunnel there's a reason why we feel this bad in training um, and it's all going to come together and then that's what I kind of wanted to go out to next like let alone we've seen so many amazing times in the sport of track and field and just the roads all across the world 
but really specifically like American women marathoning, it has crazy been crazy right the past year. And and like you guys have said, like you guys haven't got to where you specifically wanted to yet, but like every single time it comes to the conversation, when it's on the track and the 10K, or if it's on the marathon, like Kellen Taylor and Steph Bruce, Bruce and Alephine, y'all are in the conversation, like no matter what, no matter what, you're in the conversation. Just how motivating is it to see like these amazing times? Because I feel like when you see like Emma Bates do well or Nell Rojas, it's all like, bro, Sarah like, Hall. there's, there's no, ex like, I have to be on my A1 game every single time I step to the plate. Yeah, I mean, that's always the goal, you know, is to be on your A game. Um, but, you know, it certainly has helped to, I think all the American women that have been doing so well have helped to elevate other American women. Um, yeah. You know, I think success breeds success. So when you see somebody do something that's really amazing, you kind of elevate yourself and kind of put yourself on a higher pedestal than maybe you thought that you were before. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really fantastic. Part of me wishes that maybe, you know, like I was marathoning like, I don't know, 10 years ago <laughs> but, and running as fast as I was, but you know, it's still, it's great for the sport. Yeah, um, our agent loves that quote. I forget exactly, but it's like a rising tide lifts, lifts all, all boats, boats you yeah. know, and it's easy in the sport. Obviously, if someone gets first and you get second, uh, they beat you, so you lost. And <laughs> it's easy to think like, man, I wish that was me. But I think over the years, like even if Kellen and I, what we've learned, not on our A days, like we're hard to beat on our B days. So yeah. we, we bring it and we never give up. Um, and like you said, you're seeing all these Americans like really just elevate each other. Um, and so we definitely want to be part of that. And there's also a little bit that we're kind of, you say that we're mentioned, but we definitely are always the dark horses. <laughs> we're never really mentioned as favorites, like even going into the trials, you know, two years ago. Alphine was not mentioned at all. And she's like, what's up, guys? Just won by 30 <laughs> seconds. So no big deal. Um, yeah. And so there's part of our team that kind of has that, like, we fly under the radar a little bit. And that's okay with us because we put in the work. And, yeah, we're ready to bring it on race day. They hard to beat on their B days, bro. Like, I need to get to that level. That's a beast quote. Hard to beat on their B days. For real, though. And uh, thinking back to trials, one, six, and eight. Like, y'all did y'all thing. Y'all showed out for Hoka. Everyone was talking about the vapor fly going into that. But y'all were in Hoka shoes, and y'all really, y'all really dominated. If it was a cross country race, we would have won. Hoka would have won. So you mean that, that it wasn't? That's what we thought we were scoring. <laughs> hey, that's what it felt like. We were all, we were all in Atlanta cheering. That's what yeah. it felt like. It was a cross country race for real. But I wanted to go back to like 2015. Y'all both joined Nazali. What has it been like seeing the team develop? Seeing Alphine, Alphine wins the trials. You all do, do your thing as well. What has it been seeing the team just expand and continue to? flourish when the team started back in 2015 ben had just such a great vision for the team um, that you kind of just knew right off the bat that it was going to be a success um, i mean that's why i joined because everything that he said you could just tell was so like so pure yeah. so from the heart um, and this guy invested his own money into the team uh, before hoka came on as the title sponsor um, so you could just see how invested he was. Um, but, you know, since Hoka came on, you know, we've had so much support um, financially, uh, just with great product. Um, you know, they're always putting awesome shoes on our feet and good clothes to run in. Um, that the team has just come together year after year. I feel like we've continued to um, meet expectations, sometimes exceed expectations. Um, going into the trials in 2016, the goal was to put somebody on the team, and we didn't quite do that. You know, we had two fourth place finishes, so alternates, um, kind of the worst place. But, <laughs> um, you know, so then going into 2020, it was like, hey, we're going to do it. We're going to put one, two, three, you know, like several people on the team. And, you know, we didn't put several people on the team, but we certainly got somebody on the team um, in, in a flashy way, you know, with her winning the trials and all. Um, so, you know, I think that there's just more great things to come um, down the road. And Steph, what stood out about Nas Elite to you when you first joined the team? Well, I was in a unique situation because um, I was actually pregnant when I like officially joined the team. And I think what was like really unique and special about that was that Hoka was the first company, the first shoe company that was like, yep, we're going to pay you through pregnancy. We're not going to stop uh, your contract. And I remember Josh, my agent, had to 
I would say have hard conversations because this wasn't my first pregnancy. I had just had a baby and then Hoka was like, we're really excited, awesome. And then he had a little surprise six months later. <laughs> and so Josh had to jump on the phone and be like, guess what? There's also another baby coming <laughs> into the mix. Um, and I'll be honest, I was nervous um, because typically in our industry, it's understandable. They're paying me to run and having two young babies and being pregnant is not part of being able to compete at the highest level. So I wouldn't have been, you know, put off if they were like, hey, we kind of gave you a chance and you got pregnant again. Um, but I like to believe I sort of paved the way um, for then athletes like Alphine where they were like, no, this is awesome because the first email and conversation that Josh got back was, well, welcome like Bruce baby number two. They were really mm. excited about it. And so for me, that just was a huge impression and I was like Hoka is the real deal like they're not just putting up a front of what they're saying they follow through on that um, and so that was really cool and unique but on the other hand it was also a little bit of struggle for me because I did take a long time I think to get back um, to the level I believed I could just because I had two young boys at home um, but Coach Ben worked with me week by week, those first couple weeks postpartum. You know, we went from running 15 miles a week, 30 miles a week, to two years into uh, postpartum was when I was finally back to running, you know, 90 miles a week. Um, and it's really cool to think seven years later now, I feel like I'm in the prime of my career. Um, and that doesn't have to happen to many athletes, like into their late 30s. And so for me, I think the goal is leave NAZ Elite better than when it started. And so that's what motivates me to essentially do really well on the track, on the roads, but also off the roads and realize we want to bridge the gap between the professional athletes and the running community. Um, because if you guys weren't out there cheering for us, we wouldn't have jobs. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes professional athletes forget like why we're doing this. And so, yeah, that's just been a huge goal. And I want to leave the sport better than when I came in, um, you know, and specifically with NAZ Elite. And I really do believe that you guys are really setting the mark with NAZ Elite, especially in that Flagstaff community. Because over the past, well, I guess we can say now decade, like Flagstaff has really grown into where we've had conversation in our podcast. Like, is Flagstaff Track Town USA now? Yes, like, it is. Like, I don't know. It definitely it's low key, is. Definitely a rival to it. And I believe that it's rising to that level. But speaking more on just the team, like you two, both being mothers and Alephine as well, like it's just incredible to see, it's incredible to see what you guys are capable of doing. Cause my, our mother also runs, me and Aaron's mom. And she's on this- um, She got four kids. Mom, it's called MRTT, Moms Run the Town. And like, they ain't as fast as y'all, but y'all run the town too. Like, how is it to be these moms and really dominating? Like, do you guys take advice from each other? Like a lot with you guys, like children, like talking, just having that community with you every single time you train and you go on these trips, they have these people have these same experiences. How is that for you, Kellen? I mean, it's, I think that it's incredibly helpful. Um, when I joined the, well, I guess, when Steph and I first started training together, I was the only mom. Um, so there wasn't really anybody that I could ask questions to or, you know, people were willing to babysit, which is always nice. Um, <laughs> Steph especially, because she wanted kids. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, since having other moms come on, uh, you know, it's been so helpful having people to be able to bounce ideas off of, um, you know, like, am I doing this all wrong? I mean, everybody feels like they are. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it feels like... Um, we're kind of like a cohesive unit in that sense. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's more like normalized a little bit, right? I When Kellen had Kylan, that was over 10 years ago, and there weren't a lot of professional athletes, you know, that had children because uh, two things. I think there is a fear that, one, you're going to lose your contract, and so your shoe company won't pay you. And two, there haven't been enough women who are doing it that they think, can I actually do it in it? Like financially, emotionally, can I leave my child? Can I train really hard? Like all the logistics that go along with it. Um, and so for me personally, I guess I've been on a little bit of a, I wanna prove that you can do it. And I have so much support to do that, that I wanna show that I'm not just good because I'm a mom, I'm good because of all the training and all the hard work that I'm doing. Um, and 
one of my friends, Alicia Montano, she started an organization and mother. And mm. the whole mission behind that was you can be a champion and a mother. You don't have to choose between the two. Um, and Alfina is a prime example because she is a, a champion <laughs> and a mother. Um, yeah, so I think with the three of us, it's a unique situation because now our kids are so far apart. We're not in the same phases, you yeah. know, like Kellen's not asking advice on sleeping through the night or, but Alfie can go to us and ask about breastfeeding or different stuff like that. So yeah, we just kind of bounce ideas off each other and then probably have our own little complaints of what our children are doing that's annoying us. <laughs> <laughs> and thinking about it too, thinking about just your development too, how you're saying you're in your prime right now. And this, this goes back to being as a coach I feel like you and Kellen both have had great long careers. You've had your injuries, Kellen. I know you had a stress fracture when you when you did your thing at the trials and still ran amazing. But how? What do you think has contributed to the longevity of your career? Hoka shoes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think that. Well, Steph and I always talk. We talk about this a lot. Um, just like success and why we've been successful in the sport um, is because we've just taken it's not it's not people want instant success yeah and that's just not how it works 99% of the time a lot of the time you know it's gonna take years and years and years and you know we've been doing this for 10 years and we still are working our way up that hill um, so it just takes time, and I think a lot of people forget that, um, whether you're you know, just out there running and trying to finish a marathon or you're trying to win a marathon. Um, it's all kind of the same. Um, and then, you know, for, for injury, um, you know, all the basics, prehab, rehab, massage, um, all the things that people know that they should do, whether they do it or not, uh, myself included. Um, yeah, just taking care of yourself. That's incredibly important you put your body through a whole lot of uh, stress when you're running uh, training for a marathon training for a 5k training for really anything um, that you need to remember to take care of yourself be kind to yourself um, I learned this early in my career like in distance running everybody wants to be good yesterday and so you don't really want to wait for those long-term results um, and usually when you see people either breaking through or yeah, having these big moments, like you forget it is not the training cycle that they just went through. It's the last six months, the last year, the last 18 months of their training. And typically when you have uninterrupted training for months and years on ends, that's when you start to have the breakthroughs. And I think on our team, at least the culture that we have promoted, yeah, is very healthy with body image, with fueling, with all the things that makes um, someone have a long career it's we've just had a really healthy outlook and that's by fortune of either having good college coaches having good influences on us um, where our yeah our views of the sport have have been carved out I think really positively and then yeah just the long-term approach of like putting in the work staying healthy and like that's when you're going to see the results but are there there are there still those times though when like you have like a bad workout or like a bad race and you're just all like I don't know if this running thing's really for me anymore like this is just this is just too much it's not it's just not working out have there, have there, are those those times of like reflection and how do you just overcome those type of thoughts that may they may be fleeting but they're there and you may think at one point that I don't know if this is for me anymore probably after every race in the last yeah. three years <laughs> <laughs> we're too every old marathon. yeah it's like every marathon even if it goes well I'm like that was probably it that was the last <laughs> good one I don't think I have another one in me yep. um, but then you know you kind of get over it I think that a lot of the time you're very like uh, harsh on yourself right after a, a race um, or even a bad workout um, we're a lot harsher on ourselves then than if we have something that went well or even good um, we yeah, I mean, I don't know where I'm going. I've, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> yeah, uh, do not make decisions on the uphill. And that's usually right when you finish a marathon. Typically within the first 24 hours is when we have conversations with either our, hus our husband, our agent. What's next? What should we be doing? I can't believe this went that way. Um, I, I had that real moment happen after the Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. You know, it was such a mix of emotion. Alphine won. It was incredible. And then after, like, that came down, and I was like, wow. I was six and then it was like oh but you didn't make the Olympic team and then there was a moment where I was like did I do something wrong 
no. I look back at that race and I was like, that was the best race I could have run. I wouldn't have changed anything. I guess I just wish I was better on the day. And sometimes that's the best thing that can sit with you, knowing you tried your absolute best, but other people just beat you. Um, and so I've tried to take that into my races going forward that if you give your very best on the day, you will have no regrets. Some people are just better than you and there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a harsh reality, but you just go out there and you give it your all. You can't really you can't really ask for more if you put yourself out there like that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, Stephanie, uh, was how is it having been uh, as like a pacer training you? I know that you went to UCSB. He went to Cal Poly. You know, I live right down the street from UCSB. I lived in slow for a little bit. So I know that rivalry is is real. How did you how did you all how did you all meet? Or was that in college when you all met? Yeah, we met in college. Oh. Uh, we actually met at the <laughs> NCA meet. Um, I was up there watching and Ben was racing the steeplechase and he was apparently like very good and I didn't I wasn't, let's say, a running nerd back then. I thought I was, like, cool back then. Um, <laughs> I've changed a lot, more running nerd. <laughs> and, yeah, people were just like, oh, if Bruce wins the steeple. And I was like, who's this Bruce character? And um, we kind of just had this, like, random chance meeting. Uh, it was in Sacramento, and he was on his cool down, and I was walking across a bridge, and we had a mutual friend introduce us. I didn't think anything of it. And then, essentially, he didn't end up winning the steeple. He took sixth place, which was really good. Um, but that night, uh, one of my friends ended up text messaging him from my phone. And then nothing ended up happening. And then a few weeks later, um, I get a text on my phone. And it says, hi, is this Stephanie's phone? This is Ben. Um, just seeing what you were up to. And I was like, Ben, I was trying to like recall who that was. And then I realized it was who I met in Sacramento. And I just said, um, I'm actually driving out to Colorado for the summer to train, but give me a call sometime. Keyword sometime. <laughs> My phone rang a minute later. Uh, and so he, he called me and then within two minutes of talking to him, I said, I have to go. I'm being pulled over for speeding. Oh, uh, so wow. I was very excited to, to get that phone call. Yeah, and then we kind of just did long distance for a few years. Um, and we just celebrated our ninth uh, wedding anniversary. We've been together for 15 years. Awesome. And yeah, I feel like my success is his success. My failure is his failure. And I've been lucky to share everything with him. And he had a, an amazing professional running career and as his was winding down it just looked like he could have a really great role in pacing um, you know the women on our team and sometimes the men workouts and Hoka found a good spot for him to do that and so he really is just like a huge asset to myself to our team to e really everyone that meets him. I really feel like y'all are a family we were saying that earlier too we know uh, Joshua was telling me on Instagram the other day he saw like everyone came out to what was it? It was your son's yeah, like little league game. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, mine. Yes. Well, a couple oh, things. Yeah, it. both. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Her, everywhere. Yeah. Everyone yeah. Her daughter in. had a cross country race and people from the team. And then I had um, Riley and Hudson had little league last spring. And yeah, like 10 people from the team came out and watched. So it was special. But Kellen, I wanted to talk about your daughter's cross country race because I was reading the post and it was it was crazy. She got she got lost and she was destroying people. And I was like, could you explain like the story for everyone? Sure. I mean, she follows in her mother's footsteps, I guess. Is <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I used to get lost a lot when I was in high school running cross country races. So that's kind of the premise of this. Um, anyway, so this was her first year of cross country. She's in sixth grade. Um, kind of her first uh, introduction to the sport as a whole. And she shows up to her first cross country meet really excited um, to, to race and thinking that she's gonna do well. And she starts the race and they go off and they kind of run off into the woods and they do a loop up into the woods and we're waiting for her to pop out. And I'm talking to uh, the, high, the high school coach that's putting on the meet outside of the woods. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, how is it up there? Like, is it hard to get lost? And he's like, no, it's not too bad. And there's a biker that's gonna like bike with them and it'll be fine. And I'm like, okay, well, I used to get lost a lot when I was a kid. So if, she, if she's anything <laughs> like me, she might get lost. And you know, I'm waiting and waiting and like the first few kids pop out and I'm like, okay, she might be having like a rough day, that's fine. And then they just keep coming out and keep coming out and she's not coming out and I'm like, oh my, there's people walking. <laughs> I don't know, like, did she just not run? Um, 
and eventually like i start to go into the woods because i'm like did she fall her. like yeah, I, yeah. I don't know where she is and i start to make my way up and then she comes popping out and she looks fine and is talking and like happy and i'm like <laughs> okay <Kylan? laughs> did, what's going on and she's like and then she i don't think that she had realized that she had gotten lost yeah um because there it was a loop and the bike had stopped biking with her and went had went back to the group behind her and so she did the loop twice wow. and she was coming out and she thought that she was winning still <laughs> <laughs> and she was like other people in front of me and i was like <laughs> everyone yeah, most of the race guy <laughs> Yeah, and she she got done and yeah i mean i think they have our kids have come to all of our races for the last couple of years and they're starting to understand it now like they are they're almost starting to like understand our success and failures now like when i ran um, chicago marathon a few years ago and i got sixth i saw the boys and they were like you got six, sorry. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So they just like, they have really high standards for us. They know like we want to be top three wherever we go, where we want to win a race. Um, so they're actually like really bummed when we don't do the things that we want to do. But the other part of that is I think they're seeing, yeah, but our moms are trying to do our best and that's all that really matters. And we're chasing our dreams and you have to put in the work. And if you fall down you have to get back up and um yeah i think that's the most important legacy we can leave on our kids yeah and that's going to make them not only great athletes but just great people because that's how you just have to approach life sure. kellen are you seeing the same w with your kids yeah um you know with with kylan i had always struggled with like making her try like to be good at something you have to try you have to constantly put in the work and she'd be like oh but i don't want to i'm like okay well <laughs> good luck then um but now that she's started running she actually sees that and she does she's like oh i do have to like put in the work in order to see like the things that i want to see if i want to be good or better then i need to put in the work to do that um, so that's kind of like finally hitting home. And then, you know, just as a parent, it's been so fun to um, watch her just kind of grow as an athlete and um, to see her succeed. And then I also have found uh, myself in the position of support support crew mm -hmm. which is super nerve-wracking <laughs> <laughs> I guess I never understood it like from my husband and like coach and like that whole standpoint but I'm like man I'm more nervous for her in her sixth grade cross-country race <laughs> than I am for my big marathons <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I, I kind of understand that too, because I'm doing coaching for a high school with my dad this past fall, and like we were trying to like break through and get the CIF for the first time. We didn't get the well, we got individuals to go to CIF, but definitely when they were racing, lining up at Mount Sac, I was like, I don't know if they're gonna survive this, but they <laughs> they did well. They did well. And I'm a supporter now of my dad's of my dad's team, and it's it's awesome. I'm like I'm like the. I'm not really a coach of the team, but I'd be out there coaching. Like, like I'm a part of it for some reason. Uh, another thing that was really interesting about your journey, Steph, is uh, the, picky, the picky bar situation that you started off with. And I'm thinking back to how you're saying when you first joined Hoka, like you feel like you kind of paved the way for mothers. And I feel like you and Lauren Fleshman with picky bars, like that's kind of opened some doors too, like with runners, like doing things outside of just, uh, outside of just competing. What does that journey been like creating picky bars sure so yeah you know I've been a professional athlete for over a professional athlete for over a decade and I just kind of looked around and I was like man a lot of athletes finish their career and they're 31 32 and they literally are like now what they are starting over and these are people who got you know college degrees and then just went right into prof professional running but for a while there was this culture of like you just train really hard you play video games and then you don't have to do anything else and I was like I think we can change the game like I think you can do something else like that you're passionate about alongside professional running and so we were kind of forced when both Lauren and I were injured um, in 2008. We just had this chance meeting um, in a village apart in a Chase Village apartment in Eugene, Oregon. We were on the bike, and she had just missed the Olympic team, 
and I was really far away from making the Olympic team, but we were like, man, like what do we do when our professional running careers are over? And so she was trying to make an energy bar for her husband, Jesse, who was going into a professional triathlon and she just didn't like what was on the market and she's like i'm gonna try to make these bars like do you want to come over and so we shared stories got to know each other um and then we sat in her kitchen and we just googled how do you start an energy bar company in your kitchen I love that. <laughs> and I it love was that. like one uh have a business plan to get your kitchen certified and we're like all right well we can do one of those so we got the kitchen certified and then her husband jesse actually just got his mba from oregon and so we're like jesse do you want to create a business plan and a website for us and he's like sure guys um and then funny enough at the time i was doing an interview with runner's world and back then it was something called a brief chat where you just, you guys were just going back and forth and they wrote down everything that you were saying. And towards the end, I thought we were kind of done chatting. This was like just off the record shooting the crap with him. And I was like, yeah, we're gonna start this energy bar company. It's called Picky Bars. Um, we don't really know like how it's gonna go, but here are my ideas. And so right before I ran the Houston Marathon, uh, the article came out on the bottom. It says Stephanie Rothstein and Lauren Fleshman start Picky Bars. Here's a website. And I was like, oh, my God, we don't have a website. Yeah. So essentially, we asked Jesse, you got to make us something. And he made us a website off WordPress. The next day, it crashed when the article came out because wow. we, didn't, we had too much traffic going to it. And I like to say I forced them to start the company. <laughs> um, and then, you know, 10 years later, when we got our careers back going, and then we all transition. They're full-time parents. They both have retired since. I'm still going. Um, we had a huge opportunity this year where Laird Superfood uh, merged with us and essentially bought our company and kind of a dream come true. Hey, you got that bag. You got that bag. <laughs> I like to hear about, it. That's all about. Both of y'all are both definitely going to leave a legacy in the sport, in your family, and in Flagstaff as well. Just before we close out the podcast, what mark do you want to leave? on track and field uh, as a whole when you hang up the flats, the spikes, and the hokas, you know? <laughs> Kellen? <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think, like, like Stephanie says, you want to leave it better than when you came. Um, I don't know if I've necessarily figured out how I'm going to do that yet, um, but hopefully just by example through my racing, um, parenting, um, career outside of running, hopefully can do that in some shape or form. And for you, Steph? Yeah, you know, I think, I guess I've kind of solidified a little bit of what my mission and it's, I essentially want to inspire people to live the awesome life that they envision in their head but are too afraid to pursue in real life and that can unfold in so many different ways that means maybe it's starting your own company maybe it means chasing a goal that someone thinks you're ridiculous to have um, maybe that means yeah being a professional athlete but also having a side hustle so kind of whatever like life you envision actually try and go after it um, because I've definitely done some things that on paper I didn't have the audacity to do or believe but I just did it anyway um, and I've been fortunate it seems to always work out for me and and I know that you know I put this when we sold picky bars like what was amazing about that I don't want to sit here and tell you it's all just hard work because it doesn't always work out for everyone. It worked out for us, um, but realize like you are putting in the work and in some way like that good karma should come around to your life. Yeah, and just be brave enough to, to try and pursue that life that you kind of envision in your head. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie and Kellen, for coming on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Good luck in New York on Sunday. We'll be cheering for y'all especially. And yeah, I'm excited, bro. I'm excited. This is good. Yeah, super excited. Just thank you for blessing us and coming on to the podcast today. I'm sure our live audience really appreci appreciates it as well. Um, close it. We'll close it out there. Um, to everyone listening on the podcast, you know, if you listen this far into the podcast, as I always say, you truly are a day one homie. Thank you for that. For everyone attending here live today, we really do appreciate y'all coming to see us. And Joshua? Yeah, that's it. That's it. We cool. We cool. Good luck. All right. Good luck, luck. luck y'all. Thanks so much. <laughs>